Solar and wind power are the cheapest sources of energy right now, but they do have one slight drawback. They don't generate when the sun sets or there's no wind, and we can't control either of these things. Wind doesn't blow continuously in one specific area, and while the sun might shine all day long, come evening, it dips over the horizon, leaving you in darkness for hours. However, there's always daylight on half the planet, and it's always windy somewhere. So if we could connect these various energy generating locations, we would have an uninterrupted supply of renewable power, regardless of the time of day or weather conditions. But what about long distance or intercontinental connections across seas and oceans? After all, we've been connecting loved ones across the Atlantic since the laying of the first transatlantic telegraph cable in the 1850s. So can we do the same with electricity cables? The answer is yes, it can be done with high voltage direct current or HVDC interconnectors. In this video, I'm going to explain how these differ to regular AC alternating current transmission, the recent technology advances that are causing HVDC interconnectors to start popping up all over the place, and what challenges remain to be solved if we're going to connect places as far flung as Europe and North America. I'm Rosie Barnes, welcome to Engineering with Rosie. Connecting renewable energy plants is relatively easy to achieve across short distances via existing electricity grids. Australia is a good example of the benefits this can provide. We've got a really, really long grid, and when you connect wind farms way down in the south of Australia with ones in the north, there's not much correlation between the wind in those two locations. And I mean, this is kind of obvious with solar as well. If you can connect grids east to west, then you get a few extra hours of solar power in your system. There are two ways we transmit high voltage electrical power from region to region, and that's with alternating current AC and direct current DC. We use high voltage because that's how you can transmit a lot of power without a very high current. Power losses from resistance in the power lines are related to current, so lower current means higher efficiency. And efficiency is the name of the game when it comes to long distance transmission, because even low percentage losses per kilometer add up if your cables are hundreds or even thousands of kilometers long. Most of the high voltage overhead power lines you see are AC, because in the early days of electricity, AC voltage could be stepped up and down using transformers. That meant you could transmit at high voltage and therefore high efficiency, and then easily slept down to a manageable voltage in people's homes and offices. However, since about the 1950s, we've been developing better and better ways to step up and down DC voltage, so that's less of an issue. And inefficiencies due to line losses are becoming more important. There are three types of line losses, resistive, capacitive, and inductive, and AC fares worse than DC in all three. First is extra resistive losses in AC due to a phenomenon called the skin effect, where the majority of AC current tends to flow close to the outer surface of a cable. It occurs because AC's constantly changing current creates a magnetic field around the conductor, which in turn pushes the flow of electrons towards the outer surface of the wire. This means the effective diameter of the wire is reduced, making its resistance higher, so more energy is lost as heat. Next is line inductance. That's a property of cables that resist changes in the current flow by creating an opposing voltage due to the magnetic field generated by the current. It's like the line's natural reluctance to let the current change too quickly. Then we have capacitance. A transmission line together with other nearby conductive elements like the ground or ocean act like the plates in a capacitor. When you connect a capacitor to a voltage source, electrons are drawn to one plate, making it negatively charged, while the other plate loses electrons, making it positively charged. In an AC system, the voltage is always oscillating, which causes the charges in transmission line to constantly move back and forth. This continual shuffle of charges doesn't contribute to the energy transmitted, it just generates heat and results in energy losses. Because a DC system's voltage is constant, it doesn't suffer any of those three issues. It still has losses from resistance in the cable, which AC does too, but overall it's much more efficient than AC, and the longer the transmission line, the bigger the difference. For short distances, AC still wins due to its cost-effective infrastructure. However, for longer distances, power losses dominate, and DC systems are cheaper due to their higher efficiency. There's a break-even distance somewhere around 500 to 900 kilometers for overhead lines, beyond which HVDC becomes more economical than AC. And for underground or subsea interconnectors, that distance is much shorter because the capacitance effect is more of an issue when the cable is so close to the ground or water. Okay, now let's take a look at an HVDC cable and what it's made of. HVDC cables are comprised of several layers, each serving a specific function. On the inside, there's a conductor, usually copper or aluminium. This is the part that actually carries the electric current. There's an 
insulation layer surrounding the conductor, preventing electrical current from escaping to nearby conductive elements. These days, most cables use cross-link polyethylene, XLPE, as insulation, a significant improvement over the previous norm of gas and oil impregnated cables. XLPE can withstand high electric fields in HVDC cables, offering excellent electrical and mechanical properties. Moreover, it's durable and leak-proof, enabling higher voltage transmission over longer distances compared to what was possible before its use. Then there is a semiconductive insulation screen, a metallic sheath, an armoring layer, and lastly, an outer covering typically made of a polymeric material provides an overall protection to the cable from the external environment and prevents corrosion. And in some cases, fiber optic cable elements are included for communication and monitoring. There has been a lot of recent HVDC action around the world, a few of which particularly interest me. The first is Electlink, a 51 km HVDC interconnector that runs between the UK and France through the Channel Tunnel. Built by the owners of the Channel, Electlink runs inside the tunnel itself, negating the need for subsea cable laying. Because Electlink uses existing infrastructure, technologically speaking, it's not particularly special, but its financial results have piqued the interest of big businesses and governments. Electlink cost around 600 million euros to build, and it went into operation in May of 2022. By the end of that year, it had already generated 480 million euro in revenue. Extrapolate that out just a tad, and it's clear that Electlink probably more than paid for itself within its first operational year. So how does it make so much money? Basically, it's down to energy arbitrage. The company buys electricity when it's cheaper on one end of the cable than the other and sells it at a profit at the other end. For example, if it's windy in Scotland, Electlink might buy cheap wind power from the UK and sell it to France, or if it's sunny in Spain, they'll buy cheap solar power from the continent and sell it to the UK. The next really interesting project is the North Sea Link that runs from Kvildale in southwestern Norway to Blythe in the northeast of the UK. It's also in the energy arbitrage business, with the North Sea Link effectively taking cheap wind energy from the UK and selling it to Norway, and then selling cheap hydro from Norway to the UK. The 720 kilometer cable is currently the world's longest, and it's a joint project of Statnet, a Norwegian state-owned transmission system operator, and National Grid PLC, the British multinational utility company that owns and operates the electricity and national gas transmission networks within the UK. Construction originally began in March 2015, and the project went into operation in June 2021, having cost an estimated 2 billion euros. Now, that might sound like a lot, but it's generated a net income of 2.75 billion euros in 2022 alone. You do the math, as they say. So that's what's going on in Europe, where projects seem to be able to more or less stand on their own economically. But now let's move on to Australia, the world's smallest continent or largest island, depending on how you want to think about it. In particular, let's focus on a smaller island, Tasmania, which I think provides a perfect example of the future role of interconnectors. Tasmania might have a small population of about 545,000 people, but it has a whole heap of hydropower. Now, I don't feel I can talk about Tassie's hydropower without mentioning that these are the result of dams that flooded some very important and beautiful ecosystems. And if we were talking about building them today, I would for sure oppose them. But personal thoughts aside, those dams are there now and they provide the vast majority of Tassie's own power needs. Some 750 kilometres away on the mainland since Melbourne and the rest of Australia's East Coast grid, which is incorporating more and more variable renewables. Now, if you've been watching my channel for a while, then you're well aware that more variable renewables means more storage is needed. And storage is the expensive part. Tasmania is connected to Melbourne by the BassLink interconnector. So in effect, Tasmania's hydro can play the role of a battery for mainland Australia. It helps fill in some of the Dunkelflauta on the mainland. That's period with no wind and no sun. And in return, Tassie gets some of the low cost, sometimes even negative cost electricity during windy sunny periods, which means it can save its water for times when it can get paid more for the hydro. Tasmania is currently a bit constrained with the capacity of the 500 megawatt BassLink interconnector, but there are plans to expand the connection by adding a 1500 megawatt Marinus link, a proposed 250 kilometer subsea interconnector plus 90 kilometers of underground land cables. However, in stark contrast to Electlink in Europe, this is not a project that's going to pay for itself within one year for various reasons, including Victoria's own shift towards renewables, and the cost of Marinus is expected to be double that of what BassLink cost. Because of this, there's currently a bit of a squabble going on about which side should pay for Marinus. But assuming it does get built, this will enable Tassie to start developing more of their own wind resources, which they don't really have domestic demand for, nor spare capacity in the BassLink to export it to the mainland. 
And Marinus isn't the only exciting future project. There's another Australian plan, the Australia Asia Powerlink, aka Sun Cable, a mega project that will build up to 20 gigawatts of solar generation from what would be the world's largest solar farm in the Northern Territory Desert. The project also incorporates what would be the world's longest subsea HVDC cable of 4,200 kilometers to transport the electricity to Singapore via Indonesia. Elsewhere, the proposed £16 billion X-Lynx Morocco to UK power project is also claiming to be the world's longest, with 10.5 gigawatts of solar and wind farms and 20 gigawatt hours of battery storage to transmit via a 3.6 gigawatt interconnector from Morocco to the UK. Such is the enormity of X-Lynx that according to them, there doesn't exist the manufacturing capability to make enough cable for the project in a timely fashion, and nor are there any ships capable of carrying and laying such a huge amount of cable. X-Link's solution is to begin manufacturing HVDC cables themselves, and they'll be designing and building the ships as well. So that's two worlds longest, but I suppose that any number of people can claim their project is the biggest when everything is still only blueprints. Of course, as with any mega scale project, there are challenges. But as I said right at the beginning of this video, we've been laying communications cables across the Atlantic for over 150 years. So why can't we connect an HVDC interconnector to connect Liverpool to Montreal? These east to west interconnectors would effectively create up to 20 hours of daylight per day as far as solar power is concerned. And the cable could be used to transmit power in both directions in contrast to the X-Lynx or Sun Cable plans, which are just one way. In fact, I've heard that there are actually plans to build such a cable, although it's currently in the very early planning days, but we can get a sense of the issues they're going to face by looking at what its smaller cousin X-Lynx is facing, such as the necessity to build ships capable of holding and laying so much cable. There are other technical issues too, as HVDC cables get longer. Although DC is far more efficient than AC for long distances, there are still losses. Typically, an HVDC cable will encounter around 3% electrical losses per 1,000 kilometers, and across extremely long distances, this will add up. To minimize these resistive losses, you have to make cable cores thicker. But of course, thicker cable cores means heavier, less flexible cables that can't be spooled as tightly. So they take up more space on ships, and they have to be installed in shorter lengths. Another issue is the fact that cable cores are tending to move from copper to aluminium because it's lighter and therefore easier to handle and lay. However, aluminium's fatigue strength is lower than copper's, so failures are more likely if there's a lot of bending of the cable during installation and operation. Much of the costs associated with subsea cables is in their installation. Operating a cable laying ship can cost up to $750,000 per day and delays because of weather drive up those costs even further. So repairing a subsea cable can cost nearly as much as its installation. Not only is there the cost of ships, but that of specialist undersea workers and specialized equipment. Planning exactly where to lay an HVDC cable so it won't be affected or harmed by shipping and fishing will be vital in future subsea interconnector projects. All of these engineering problems can be solved and no doubt will be within the next few years, but there might be a different showstopper that no amount of technical innovation or clever logistics can solve. Politics. There's a big energy security question when one country supplies a large chunk of another country's electricity supply, as we've all seen with Russia's supply of natural gas to Europe. Politics has the potential to ruin the Morocco to UK or Australia to Singapore interconnector projects. A few years ago, China announced plans to link up the whole planet with an HVDC network, but I think political barriers are likely to stop that one from ever getting past the talking stage. Despite the immense technical benefits such a system would bring to the global energy transition, the ramifications of one nation wielding so much control over a global power supply are probably insurmountable. I do think it's inevitable that we'll end up with HVDC interconnectors linking out much of the world's grids, but I expect it will be done project by project and international agreement by agreement and definitely between politically friendly countries first. Anyway, all that's politics and I've veered too far away from my actual sphere of expertise, which is engineering, so I'll stop that. If you've enjoyed this video, please take a second to click the like and subscribe buttons and tell your friends. And if you'd like to support the channel on Patreon and help me make more videos and live streams, you can join up at this link. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.